By the way, I took out the word distinguish from the Katz lecture, but only because I have to be distinguished first. So I'm hoping that in the permanent version that it will be restored. It, it was really just an act of modesty. Now the, t the, the, the title or the subtitle is, is an act of immodesty. Um, I could give the whole lecture with one slide. Here we go, Ben. Your university, this is Fura Bay College, the oldest um, center of higher learning in West Africa, founded in Freetown, itself an abolitionist riposte to the very active slave trade of the time, late 18th century. Uh, but it was burned during the war, which rolled out the red carpet for Ebola. And I'm going to talk about, um, Ben told me to. I'm, I'm going to try to think a little bit about um, history and political economy. My clinical field is infectious disease. If I talked like this in the middle of Browns, it would go very poorly. Uh, but this is our chance to, to think hard about that, that context and the outside of the whale. Um, it could be argued um, that the response to Ebola, and I'm going to focus on Ebola, so we have time for Q&A, but you know, obviously Ebola is new to me, and I'll talk a little bit about the history of um, these, this, uh, this group of pathogens. Knowing when to recognize a pattern, again, the chastening work that is important, even in the middle of an epidemic. I mean, if there, I have friends here who showed up in West Africa to do, to think about laboratory capacity, doctor, like Dr. OKK, or to think about nursing care, the crucial intervention that we should have made all along to save lives and reduce what might as well be called case fatality rate of X number of people who fall ill, how many die, right? Um, that critical thinking, it was pretty obvious uh, early on, at least by the summer of 2014, that what was going on was an inversion of the standard social contract of medicine, which is we'll put patients first. Now, there were reasons for this inversion. And the flip was that the job is to stop transmission, number one. Second, to protect healthcare professionals. And the third was to save lives of those already afflicted. Right? And this was advanced with a high degree of uh, moral certitude all through, and still is. And, uh, and it, 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 it's, uh, this offers a chance for me to interrogate that logic, to ask where it comes from, to ask how it is that if we live in one world and not three, that this inversion would never have occurred in this country, and in fact did not. So that's, that's my modest little intervention. Oh, and by the way, even though I'm going to argue that the control over care paradigm has its real roots in the high formalism of European occupation of West Africa, that is colonialism, that it has many more remote underpinnings as well, and hence my pretty groovy little triangular trade map that Katie Krylovitz, who was here with me, made. Now, that's an awful lot to cover in one lecture. I should be able to do this in about three hours. Um, but a little background um, uh, on, sorry, on, did I do, get the right one? Yes. Yes. Just a little background on this notion of control over care and colonial medicine. Now, the Pasteurian revolution, I got to be careful because there's a lot of historians here. You know, I could say whatever I wanted about history of the 19th century and 20th century at the Brigham Women's Hospital, and no one's going to know if I'm wrong. It's, you know, here, not so easy. Um, this is actually not, this is the one place this picture that is supposed to be not a colony, Liberia. But in fact, close scrutiny of the history of Liberia shows it too is a settler colony, the settlers being Americans who may have shared more or less skin color with the natives of the region, but very little else, and had the same 
aspirations, same, as we say in scholarly terms in anthropology, same cultural hang-ups that the British and the French, who controlled the biggest patches of colonial West Africa, which was really established in the late 19th century and well into the 20th century. Um, the roots of control over care paradigm lie in the Pasteurian revolution that microbiologists deployed in a very different way in Europe and North America. Now, as an example, I just want to mention, because you know that's the thing about talking about histor history in front of historians. Um, I, I don't go to primary archives, although I did find, with the help of the aforementioned Katie Filovitz, I'm sure you all recognize this ship. The HMS Mantua, 540 feet foot long, merchant cruiser converted in World War I into, wait, it was converted into a merchant cruiser, right? And it was headed on a, uh, protecting a convoy left Plymouth, I believe in early August 1918 during the second wave of the great influenza pandemic. Right? And it was going from Plymouth, with a crew of, I think, 320 and a, and a um, four, 40 officers and escorting a convoy. Um, they were headed looking for gold, which was needed to fund the war effort. And they were headed toward the largest mid-Atlantic, deepest mid-Atlantic port, and that was Freetown, Sierra Leone, home of Fort Bay College, which had been neglected in recent years since by 1918, the British had excluded all black doctors from, since after 1902, from the colonial medical services. Uh, that's a hint that control over care is going to be a dominant logic. But the real way to look at control over care is to look where the budgets and the monies are going. Are they going to health care, and if so, for whom? Right, obviously. I don't know, 99% of the people living there would have been natives, or maybe it was 95 and the other five were Creoles and 1% were British officers. Um, and you can see very clearly that the monies that did go into medical care were largely for quarantine, isolation, the destruction of infected housing, even when the causes of the pathogens in question, that is the vectors, some were, I mean, take malaria. Malaria, uh, as you all know, is transmitted by a mosquito. So for the British to propose to segregate Freetown and build an entire new campus, let's call it, because that's what it looks like, 800, 1,000 feet above the sea level for, for white people, um, I mean, there's an obvious missing point here, and that is that mosquitoes have wings. And they also could ride, to add insult to injury, they built a train line from the city up to this place. So the mosquitoes could ride fair free <laughs> all the way to the top and give people up there, which in included not just Britons, but also West Indian troops. The British still call the Caribbean West Indies, I think. When are they going to get over that? Anyway. Uh, these kinds of interventions, control over care, were different but similar, right? So if trypanosomiasis, African sleeping sickness, as a TC, you know, as a, a flying vector, again, um, maybe you wouldn't want the same approaches as to influenza or smallpox, for which there was already a, a vaccine. The story of the HMS Mantua is interesting because it introduced, quite probably, um, the virulent strain of influenza that took out maybe 50 million people. That could be a conservative estimate toward the close of World War II. And I'm, I'm just putting it there um, uh, to say that the control over care paradigm, and this, I'm talking about caregivers, by the way, I should, should have said earlier on, that the majority of all caregivers are not professional, right? They're family members, they're moms, aunts, sisters, nice dads, uncles, right? They're your family. And the caregivers in the formal colonial system 
uh, were focused on disease control and not on caregiving. And when they were, it was for white patients largely working for private firms. This was true in Britain. It was true, meaning British colonies. It was true in France. Now, the introduction of influenza happened on a certain day. And I say that I'm not using archives, but with the help of the aforementioned Katie Kravitz, the ship's log is declassified. So all these really smart medical historians who've written big fat books about this, they were wrong. You know, I got to read the ship's log. It's just that. Why would you classify the ship's log for 50 years? But they did, or 80 years. So this was a raging epidemic by the time they crossed the enormous boom defenses that had been placed on the outside of Freetown's estuary. And of course, white people are not going to shovel coal. Native laborers, this is in the ship's log, native laborers commence the coaling. I'm still trying to decide if it's correct to say commence the coaling. I believe it is, right? They commence the coaling. Uh, and within within a week or so, 4% of all of Freetown is dead. Then the influenza spread through the rail networks that have been recently introduced. As if the rail networks have been designed, a couple of medical geographers, Ben, there I said medical geographer. Could you please check that box? Um, have, have, have argued that it was as if the whole thing was set up to spread influenza that way. Now, where does control over care come in? Well, the argument was being made, interestingly, especially in Britain, which had the most sophisticated public health apparatus of any country. These are empires. It's funny how, as soon as the end of World War II, II by the way, the empires suddenly get to be called industrialized democracies. Historians shouldn't allow stuff like that to happen. Anyway, the empire uh, that was Britain had the most sophisticated machinery, but focused on, again, disease control. And I have, a, I have something from the LEGO standard. I'm sure you all read the LEGO standard. Now, our colleague from Nigeria, um, from a, a different city, well, this, this is a pretty Pretty beautifully written editorial. These were all, these were Africans writing these, so maybe may Creole Africans. But these, this newspaper is edited by, uh, by Nigerians, right? And anybody who was involved in the Ebola response would just read that and see if that doesn't remind you exactly of what you saw or read about in West Africa. Not in Bethesda, not in Atlanta not in Omaha, not in parts of Europe where people were airlifted out, but sending people into Ebola treatment units, ETUs, with very little in the way of tea, which tea, or community care centers, with very little in the way of the Middle Sea. Uh, this went on through the whole epidemic. After billions of dollars were pledged, case fatality rates, and remember that term, that is how many people got sick, and of those, how many died. Case fatalities didn't budge. You know, uh, and that's because the world's largest public health endeavor remained a clinically paltry one. So this is a different reading of Ebola, not as a successful intervention, but as a failure. People, people have said to me, and to many of you, well, how is it that Ebola was stopped? And I'm tempted to say, although my mother has told me sarcasm is not welcome, I don't know. Why don't you ask the Atlantic Ocean, right? Because that's where it stopped when it hit the, hit the ocean. Now, what's special about this disease? Well, first of all, control over care has been the story of Ebola since it was first identified because of an outbreak in a remote region of the northeast, of northeastern Congo. Uh, it's not the first of what was, you know, uh, it's not the first of the species identified. First was Marburg. Again, another story of political economy. Marburg, if it sounds like a city in Germany, that's because it is. And it was monkeys imported, I believe, from Uganda via London. That's a shorter trip than the one I made yesterday. But Uganda via London to Hamburg, 
to Belgrade, Hamburg, and Marburg, and who fell ill? Laboratory workers. What were they working on? Polio vaccine. Right. So this was about not eating bush meat. I mean, some of them may have taken a snack or two from a monkey. I, I don't know if they do that in Marburg. Germany, well, anyway. Um, but in general, this was about person to person spread, right? Monkey to person spread, not because of monkey jerky, um, but because of handling uh, an animal that is not the natural host of Marburg. If it were, why would all the monkeys be getting sick, right? Uh, and then it spread to caregivers at home and caregivers in hospitals, right? So in Yugoslavia and Germany. Now, when in 1976, something similar and different happened, similar because the spread was similar. Again, person to person spread because of a lack of staff, dust, spacing systems, and laboratories able to identify a pathogen, in this case, a new pathogen. And by the way, with the exception of a few centers in Nigeria, this part of West Africa still lacks all of this diagnostic capacity, even simple rapid tests that are nothing like the giant, bulky, laboratory of mid 20th century virology, still to this day. And Nigeria and a couple other places are moving this agenda forward. I'm proud that I get to uh, be here at the same time as Dr. Okoche. But basically, this part of Africa, a rural region of northeastern Congo, and I'll be talking about Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone Liberia, and Guinea, clinical desert. Right? So, if you say medical desert, I'm sure you're familiar with the term. Clinical desert, that's why Ebola kills. Public health desert, that's why it spreads. That's what a medical desert is. And what we did was split these into two different sets of tasks. Let's just focus on, let's say, the public health desert, stopping transmission. But there's a problem. Ask the nuns who lost their co-workers in the Congo when this pathogen, unidentified, ripped through the hospital. People, nuns do whatever else, I mean, they've taken vows, right? But when they're sick, they seek care. Just like all the people they were serving in their 120 bed hospital with guess how many doctors? Zero, all right? So no lab, no doctor. And these poor ladies were Flemish, as it transpired died, so did the priest, so did the doctor from elsewhere in the Congo that came and helped. And that's what alerted Europe again, in this case Antwerp and other cities German, in Germany and, and in England and, and the CDC in Atlanta that we, that, that we need to go and figure out what this is, right? So there's a pattern there again that fits into the one that was mentioned already by Catherine. So that's a brief history. Now I have, want, want to say one thing. So Yambuku Zaire, that's the name of the place in the Congo, Marburg you heard about. So Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, I, I want to try a thought experiment. How many of you have heard that Ebola is, was new to West Africa in late 2013? How many that it was new, right? I still hear it all the time. But there is, there's something very mysterious. It's like this, these giant uh, genomic, genomic machines that you have. It's called Google, okay? And you can just look up the articles written about Ebola virus in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea in the years after the wars ended, a little on war in a second, um, or and even before in the 80s, right? So the idea that it wasn't there, again, it, 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 the medical error and scientific error are interesting because you know, you'd think if there's ample documentation and you can use these powerful search tools to find all sorts of stuff, all sorts of useless stuff, I might add, that you could easily find out. You could go through the data that suggested that this was already a problem. A friend of mine um, who is an infectious disease doctor from Sierra Leone, had spent eight years in a place called Kenema. Has anybody been to Kenema? Some of you have heard of uh, Professor Ch 
State Kumar Khan, who worked with colleagues at Tulane, Harvard. One of my students named Parda Sabeti has worked with him. I love when I can say, hey, one of my students, she sequenced Lassa. That sounds cool, right? She did, I mean, with her African colleague. Um, so they had done a study which for a decade since the war ended in about 2002, which showed that the most common hemorrhagic fever there, Lassa fever, which is transmitted by rats to humans, but again, it's not like people frolicking around with rats. Once it's introduced to the human species, it spreads person to person. Like all you need is one rat, one monkey, they're not part of the equation anymore, right? It's the human to human spread because we don't have gloves, face shields, you know, bath dust basin systems to protect caregivers. And it's bad in hospitals and it's worse in poor homes. Right? So that's the backstory of how these diseases were spread, how they were identified. And so you'd think, and there's a really good, just a, a report from 1976, the first, you know, Mbuku, first Ebola outbreak. Of course, it's not the first Ebola outbreak. That just means that it's the first time Ebola collided with the adequate staff stuff basin systems to identify what's killing poor people. And it probably happened because some of them were white Flemish nuns, right? But there's no reason to believe that it's a new virus. And if it's an emerging infection, it's emerging into human consciousness because there is laboratory capacity to identify it, right? Same story with Lassa. Struck a white missionary nurse in 1969 in Nigeria, Joss, I believe, identified. Now you can look for it in other places. That's what my friend worked on. Um, he did a study for a better part of a decade, shortly after he finished medical school, and I'll, I'll return to Dr. Khan in a minute, uh, which showed that of patients who looked like they had Lassa fever, which has similar, forgot this, every time I I was working so hard then and trying to get this just right for a general audience and I thought I'd say, what are the symptoms of Ebola? Anybody? Fever. Diarrhea. 10 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> now, hemor hemorrhagic symptoms, that's what I would have said, right? That's what I used to say. And then you start looking at the symptomatology and signs and symptoms and it's very low and on the list. What else? Yeah, you're, you're making a great gesture. Either you're, that's a vomiting gesture, right? Yeah, vomiting, fever, diarrhea. Three great ways to lose fluid and electrolytes, right? And if it's hot, under a tent. How many of you have been to Sierra Leone, Liberia? 200 inches of rainfall a year, parts of it, it's hot, all right? Um, and that's the symptoms, right? diarrhea, or you can go right through abdominal pain, but hemorrhagic symptoms are actually quite low. So now the question that was raised, and alas, not really raised in the Ambuku, was do we have treatment for fever, diarrhea, nausea, and vomit? Well, I mean, in Marburg, uh, in 1967, uh, they seem to have it. Right? Because the case fatality rate in Germany in 1967 was under 23% for a completely unknown pathogen that was obviously very virulent. But ever since then, in Africa, which is where these epidemics occur, usually in increasingly deforested and war disrupted areas, case fatality rates are sometimes 90%, sometimes more. Okay, now the big question for social medicine and for cultural studies and for cross-disciplinary work, and for infectious disease physicians, for genomics. How do we explain these differences? Not in terms of decades, but just case fatality rates. I would say that anyone interested in equity, which is a lot of you, should be asking that question. Why is it that the same pathogen, not a different strain of the same pathogen, right? Because this recent epidemic was caused by the same strain a Zaire strain, and in fact, a couple of clades, one of which spread rapidly. So the Americans who got Ebola, who all lived, including a couple of my friends, are to be compared with 
their peers, the African health professionals, about 70% of whom died a few, more than 70% at the end of the epidemic. Then, in other words, it went, even went up, right? Now, I submit to you that in the 19th century, the explanation for this would have been clear, and that would have been racial differences. Every single one of these has been disproven except as a biosocial determinant. Right? Racism is real socially, right? And it causes differential access to prevention and to therapies of all sorts. But that's not genetically determined, right? This is socially determined. And what happened with Marburg happened with Ebola. And the reason I mentioned the post-colony is the colonial experience of formal occupation of this part of the world set the standard for control over care. Right? And it went on after, although there were many who combated it during the colony, by the way. There were govern governors who said, that's ridiculous. The governor of Lagos, in fact, himself at one point said, we're not going to segregate Lagos from malaria. Why don't we do something different? Identify, diagnose, and treat African children, and then we won't need to move. McGregor was his name, and I believe he was Scottish. Right? So not everybody agreed, but this was the dominant. And if you remember that article, that line from the Lego Standard in 1918, he described people being shoved into rooms with cement floors. It could have been written. This is, of course, an Ebola patient. Right? And this is what a lot of these places look like. Right? Now, I went the wrong way. Don't worry. I'm going to catch up. To set the stage a little bit more, um, we talked about, just I mentioned with my uh, gratuitous triangular trade slave uh, slide, um, why is this part of the world so important? Right? Well, this is the epicenter of the modern world, West Africa, the Atlantic world, some people call it. Still the epicenter, probably soon to be displaced perhaps by China, still the epicenter of the modern economy. Right? 12 million people, the largest forced migration in human history, and there are tens of millions of unfree descendants who built the Americas. Right? So this triangular trade is not unimportant, and it is the reason, that is the desire for the extractive trades, or the desire for profit from the extractive trades, that the European powers in the late 19th century scrambled. That's what they called it, the Great Scramble. That's why they were scrambling for Africa. And colonialism may have been a failure, a political failure, but it was a very profitable failure for many. Right? Now, in 1926, in Sierra Leone, in a, or was it, yeah, 1930, maybe, the historians are bugging me. Cheap geological surveys, British did things like this. 3,000 pounds sterling, diamonds, they found diamonds. A lot of diamonds, millions and millions of carats with diamonds. And unlike the ones in South Africa, deep in those kimberlite pipes like that one, you could get them by just canning, right? These are called shake shakes, I believe. So there was a huge explosion of people to this part of the country, which happened to be Koidu, and then another stream of diamonds was found to have trickled across Kenema district where Again, Humar Khan, my friend, was working on Lassa fever. And uh, some people would argue that this set the stage for the war that would later make Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea clinical deserts and public health deserts. So you say, well, why Guinea? They didn't have a civil war. Well, a quarter of all Sierra Leoneans went there as refugees. That counts as war to me, right? So looking backwards, and historians like to do this, and I like to copy historians, it seems like this was an inevitable epidemic. It was inevitable that this would be the big urban epidemic of Ebola. There was no reason it wouldn't happen. Encroachment on forests, where some species, probably a bat, um, uh, is a natural host, right? People who live near forests. I mean, the, the very term bushmeat, right? How, how, how much do we hear about bushmeat? Right? 
you call it game. You call it maid. That was an old advertisement, but no one really appreciated it. But in any case, horse people bump into animals. They eat them, right? Game. But that's not how this epidemic went wild. And why would it have only spread in three countries? Some of you are going to say, well, what about Mali? Well, what about Mali? What about Senegal? What about Nigeria? Nigeria limited the epidemic rather sharply and also had a case fatality rate in which the majority of patients survived. And I'll say one thing. It's when, you, when, you're, when it's 100 degrees, or at least it feels that way, and humidity is however high humidity can go, you know, it's nice to have an air-conditioned clinical unit. A mass, even a mass unit is air-conditioned. Nigeria had that. Walking into one of these Ebola treatment units in full personal protective equipment, uh, you last, at my age, you last about 10 minutes, right? Before you just can't breathe, right? Younger people do better. Right? But this all was destined to happen in this path and not any other. Um, now, it'll happen elsewhere, and it'll spread elsewhere, but this was the ideal setting is what I'm saying. So the stage is set. And the last episode, and this, I don't know if Danny Hoffman is here tonight, but he's written a very compelling book in which he argues that those aren't really different wars at all. He calls them the Mano River War. This is the river that separates Sierra Leone and Liberia. Um, and, you know, the more you follow his logic, he's a, he, I don't know, are you here? Where are you? Man, I tell you, I love being a doctor, uh, but, I, and I like, I love being an anthropologist. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist whenever I'm awake, okay? But, like, hanging around with, uh, with, uh, with factions, you're, you're a brave man. I want to I wanna have dinner with you, okay? Um, but Professor Hoffman argues this is one long war with a very different chronology, let me say. This is an important corrective, right? Because this is a regional war and a regional epidemic. Um, this is Freetown, by the way, which is a city I know very well, and uh, was twice was sacked um, by... There's an interesting neologism. I love it. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but I love it. It's so bells. Soldiers by day, rebels by night. I'm sure Danny has met some of them, right? But basically, the government was complicit, the military high command, working with the rebels, funded by Charles Taylor and others, rebels in Liberia, with diamonds that came from Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone, sold via Liberia to whom? To us, 70% of diamonds are going from this, these parts are going to America, right? So this place was trashed. In fact, some of the places I know, I met someone today here who worked with us in Harper, Liberia. Where are you at? Can I end the prep with a preposition in the humanities lecture? I know you're here somewhere. She will tell you, is it Catelyn or Caitlin? She will tell you, Catelyn? Catelyn, right? Hey, you know, Catherine. Everybody can be called Catherine. My daughter's name. Catherine. I mean, is this true or not? Harper looks like the war was over last week. Oh. Yeah, plants growing outside of buildings, inside the buildings, right? Doesn't count, right? They're burned down. They have trees growing in the middle of them. So the stage was set. Now, I guess you could always say that looking backwards, but, and, and again, Danny Hoffman has, has warned, be careful not to overuse history to explain certain phenomena. He's referring to uh, a group of, um, well, I don't, the Camajor. See, I read your book carefully. Did it ask me to blurb it? So the stage is set. I thought there was a cool slide that you would laugh. I'll explain it. The Mono River, you can see, would be right between, is that on there? I can't see. Yeah, Li Liberia and Sierra Leone. December 2013, some, any, anybody here study origin stories? Right. People love origin stories. 
Peter, right? He's taking care of it. He's got it. Where's his money? It's, a, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a bizarre preoccupation, if you ask me. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. OKK, but it's quite different, difficult in a clinical desert to know what's causing febrile deaths. Right? If you don't have the staff stuff to face the system, is it malaria? Is it typhoid? Interestingly, they said cholera a lot when this started in a place called Meliandu uh, because they had positive cholera tests which were having to be false positive and cholera doesn't usually cause fever anyway, right? So this went on from whenever it started. But let me just say in general sociology of science terms, this is retrospective work that's largely speculative. Some of it I'm sure is quite right and, and the new tools of genomics will help us unravel this, right? But more or less, we could say that somewhere in Eastern Guinea, the, the part that bothers me, of course, is that this poor kid, Emil, who is sometimes one and sometimes two, sometimes in between, and why do we have to say his name anyway? Patient zero, and his four-year-old, he dies, his four-year-old sister dies. His mother, who is eight years, eight, sorry, eight months pregnant, which would imply unusual fecundity if he was two and she was four. Anyway, decimates the family, horror show, right? Not an unusual one. Then grandma dies, 46 years old. Then the nurse that took care of her in Guecadu. And so it goes on outwards in ever expanding circles. Right? Not in direct lines. By the time this was figured out in March to be Ebola, it had already hit Conakry, Monrovia. And for some reason, there was the persistent argument that it hadn't invaded Sierra Leone. Now look at the map. How, I, do I get brownie points, Ben, for saying look at the map? So Meliandu, you can see, Quekadu, there's all kinds of places right across these rivers. Annie Hoffman like hopped, skipped, and jumped over them on little rafts all the time. In the middle of a war. Can we have dinner sometime? I hate war. I'm, I'm, I'm not a coward, but you know. So of course it had spread there the NIS. And this is where my friend Umar Khan was working. He, he diagnosed the first case, uh, which came again over the border from Guinea into a place called Kaolan. Why did I put we're number one? I almost put a husky there because I thought that would be good. Katie, the aforementioned Katie Carter that said no, that's just too cutesy. So this is a clinical desert, meaning it's a medical desert. It's a clinical desert, so people die because no one, you know, if you don't, how, how, how much fluid can you lose when you're vomiting, have diarrhea, fever? You can lose up to 10 liters a day. One of my friends did. And he was airlifted to Atlanta, to Emory University Hospital. And we work together now to this day. Almost died, would have, um, losing 10 liters a day. Now, what was the recommended standard therapy for Ebola in West Africa? I mean, militantly recommended. Oral rehydration salts. Now, if you have children, they're notoriously non-compliant. What about yay, yay high? Be like, you drink that Pedialyte or you will be punished. I got a friend here who's a pediatrician, right? There she is. They don't always cooperate with you, do they? That's why we have this cute little IV bag sometimes when they're vomiting or something. You know, little, not like the big ones. So if you're vomiting, you have nausea, you're losing mass amount of fluids, and the formal and informal recommendation of treatment for you if you're in West Africa is go drink Pedialyte. You could be in a lot of trouble, right? Lanny, you're losing a lot of effluent, all those, all that electro, all those electrolytes, and here we are, we're spending, by the way, we're number one, let me tell you what that means. In the, the clinical desert, as measured, its economy is measured by that tired calculus of rate of GDP growth. Sierra Leone was number one in the world in 2013. The next year after Ebola, it fell to next to last above cholera stricken Yemen. Now, why am I saying that? Not to show the profound effect of a disease. Uh, 
an epidemic on the economy, but to show that money from the extractive trades were never invested in the SAP stuff space the system required for either medical care or education for the population. Not in colonial times and not too much after colonialism either. And after colonialism came something called structural adjustment, a series of faddish policies advanced by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund and seeping into humanitarian organizations, local banks, private and public, even, even missionary groups, right? And you're familiar with the logic, even though you might not use the term structural adjustment. Something isn't cost effective. It's not feasible. It's not sustainable. It's not reasonable to try and do this in Africa with Africans, Haiti, with Haitians. Logic was everywhere. Instead, what do we get? Ebola is real. That, I mean, this billboard is still up, right? Like the people I saw who just lost a dozen family members, they were not arguing that Ebola wasn't real. Right? Now, just as in Berkeley, California, they may have strange ideas about what causes illness, right? But, you know, the problem was the lack of staff stuff space and systems to prevent transmission within clinics, hospitals, and even households when Plan A, which was to take care of sick people in clinical facilities with the help of health professionals, gave way to Plan, plan B was, uh, we have to give up. Right? We're just never going to succeed. That's the logic. And we're number one in terms of the rate of GDP growth to number 190 in terms of enthusiasm. And that is not coming from our African colleagues by and large. That's not the lack of enthusiasm for trying harder, air conditioned mass, un mass units, better ways of rehydrating people with central lines, intraosseous needles, trying new therapies. That my colleagues from Africa were quite enthusiastic about it. Now, some of them died because they were enthusiastic about it, but that's because they didn't have the staff stuff space and systems to help them. This is an imported logic with deep roots in the Pasteurian revolution I mentioned that began at the end of the 19th century. Example, I only knew four Sierra Leoneans when I first set foot there, June 2014 for a surgery meeting. Anybody here? It's a big crowd. Thank you. Maybe I am distinguished. Anyway, um, we went there. We had a meeting. There were three meetings. This is for, I'm sure you all read The Lancet every week. You ever notice how medical journals have downwardly mobile names? I mean, the main gastroenterology journal is called Gut. OK. So anyway, we were doing a report for The Lancet. First meeting was at Harvard Medical School. Third meeting, Dubai. And since I was helping to organize the meeting with my surgical pals, I said, look, you know, we got to go to the medical desert to have the second meeting, right? We can't have a meeting in Dubai and Harvard, all right? The other suggestion was somewhere in Scandinavia. I'm like, no, 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 no. So we went to Freetown. Now, it's not easy to find a hotel accommodation for 100 people, right? So when the news came out, Again, that's Dr. Khan over there, where the left lung would be. The mediastinum. You know, sometimes I have to tell jokes because this stuff is so sad to me. Serious. Martin Salia, surgeon. That's my student, Byler Berry. The fourth one that I knew was also a surgeon. He, he attended the conference also. At the, at the very time when Newsweek is showing that, you know, the back door to Ebola is all those crazy Africans eating chimpanzee meat. Two of, two of the, these three people were dead of Ebola, including Dr. Khan, the Ebola expert. By, in, on July 29, he died. And so, of course, caregiver disease, but wasn't that different with lay people? These are three, these are three of my patients who survived, had nothing to do with me. Um, they become good friends. And we're, and we still work together. There over here where the right lung is, that's her partner. They had a baby. That's her best friend. Her grandfather lived in a rural area. He is a traditional healer, right? Well, there aren't healthcare professionals. People are always looking for care, getting it from family. No professionals. There'll be plenty of traditional healers all over the place, especially, especially Berkeley. So, 
the grandfather dies. His son, her father, who was caring for him, he gets sick, comes back to Freetown. She takes care of him. The best friend helps. You know what it's like to take care of someone who has uncontrollable diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, you know, um, or, or just sweating all over, right? There are billions and billions of infectious Ebola particles all over a room, right? And of course, people got sick. They all got sick. Their baby died. Their father died. And on and on it went. Ebola is caused by caring about other people. Nursing. And what is the last act of caregiving all over the world? Burial, right? Or as we said during the epidemic, funerary ritual. Why, why, why did the anthropologists let this gets so out of hand. I mean, there's something else called grief, you know, losing your mother when she falls down right in front of you. This is what someone said to me. I'm going to introduce him in a second, then I'm going to remember I have to stop. His name's Ibrahim. He became one of my, he's like almost like an adopted son. He told me one, uh, one night, first night I met him, he said, I lost 22 members of my family in Ebola in one month. What do you think of that? I shared this with Ben's mom, Dina, the chapter that I wrote about it, and I, I, I had nothing to say. I just, just I didn't answer. I didn't, I didn't know what to say. What, what do you think about that? That never happens. No disease does that. An earthquake, a genocide, a war, maybe, but you know, to lose that many people in one month. And he said something very unusual to me. How many of you are anthropologists, if I may? Well, you know, I, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but. All those years in Haiti, and maybe 10 in Rwanda, I, I was never a good anthropologist in Rwanda. Um, I mean, bad anthropologist in Rwanda. A good doctor, okay, really good doctor. But I just didn't, I wasn't there for that reason, you know. And in Haiti, you know, I, I got to be a grad student and learn the language and read every arcane. I mean, like, this is way more arcane than Danny Hoffman. Including your article on the West. Point slum, which I also read. Good piece. Um, you know, I didn't have a chance to do this in the middle of an epidemic, or the inclination for that matter. But this kid said to me, Ibrahim, he said, uh, I want you to interview me about my, the worst month of my life. That was probably the first time that anyone's ever said that to me in 30 something years, right? And I I don't know how he knew that I was an anthropologist. I had interviewed some people, but very perfunctorily, enough to know how they got sick. And I did. I spent years with him. It was very painful. I messed up. I was doing so well, Katie. There's Ibrahim, 27 years old, and he got sick. He kept on asking me, can I do something to help? I'm recovered. Aren't I immune? He wasn't recovered, and we didn't know if he was immune. Of course, anyone can say, yeah, you got Antibody should be immune. But we used to say that about HIV or TB. You couldn't get a second infection or dengue. You know, there's a lot of mistakes we make about immunity, right? Anyway, I could say, why would I, an American, think it would be my privilege to tell him what he could or could not do? I could say that. Sounds like a really, you know, thoughtful, progressive thing to say, but it isn't, you know. Kid's an orphan. He's not a kid, but, but he seemed like one just then. Anyway, I told him about this girl named Mariatu. He, he, Ibrahim, that's Mariatu's father. He, Ibrahim, had, was more or less recovered. I wasn't sure, but more or less recovered by January 2015 or late December when she fell ill. She fell ill just before Christmas. Um, happily, Trump seemed to have miss the fact that this is a minority Mus majority Muslim country. Thank you, Jesus. So he didn't, he, he tweeted 102 times, by the way, Ben, about Ebola. And let's just say it wasn't very nice. Um, anyway, so Mariachi falls sick Christmas. And uh, her, it was a mess in this unit. Eight, you know, it was an abandoned, Danny, get this, this is, it was an abandoned, vocational school for the disarmament, 
CVR, Strong Reintegration Genesis Velocity Covenant. I hate UN acronyms. And who would abandon a building in the middle of rural Sierra Leone? It has to be pretty bad, right? We got assigned to it before we saw it. We said, oh, well, you're going to be working in, a, in an Ebola unit in, in Maforki. And uh, my colleague, Viola Berry, glanced. I mean, that might not be a culturally correct way of saying looked scared. But he looked around and I thought, that's a bad sign. Maforki must be right near the epicenter of the epidemic, which it was. Fort Lowe District. And and we said, yes, Mr. Minister. And it seemed like an agreeable thing to say. And we were hoping the Cubans were going to come because we've worked with them a lot. We knew if they came, they'd focus on clinical stuff, not control over care. And they'd help with both the integrate prevention and care. So it turns out that it was abandoned. Uh, it had no walls, no electricity, no water, no drainage. And in one weekend, looking like that, Still no power. It filled up 106 beds. That's what it looks it's good on paper, 106 bed ECU. But you know, I have to say, I have to credit my colleagues from Partners in Health, and some of them are here. Any Partners in Health, John, Laura, others, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Eight percent of all Sierra Leonean survivors walked or were carried out of that. Unit. That shithole. Now that's appropriate use of the word shithole. Mariatu had a negative blood test, but she wouldn't speak. She hadn't said a word. She was taken to the hospital, the nearby public hospital. The ner best nurse in the hospital said she's brain damaged. Now there's no CAT scan or neurologist, or, but never said a thing, never spoke to her father. Her mother and sisters died. And Ibrahim saw these pictures on the viewfinder of one of my colleagues from Partners in Health, Beck Rollins. And um, they, you know, she's a photographer. She took that picture probably, but it was on a beach lot in Oregon. He almost jumped out of his seat. In fact, he did jump out of his seat, annoyingly close to me. And not because of Ebola or anything. Um, and he said, I want to help this girl. And I said, well, you know, you just lost 22 members of your family to Ebola. You know, really? Is this really the best place for you to make a contribution? Anyway, he went. And something very interesting happened. This is my last anecdote. He lied. So we walk in. I, well, I had already seen her. The reason they asked me to see her is they said, well, she's not getting better. She has a negative Ebola test and her peripheral blood. She weighs 28 pounds. She hasn't eaten. I put a feeding tube down. So had another physician. And they said she had a fever. She didn't, by the way. At Harvard training. Check yourself, Lanny. So, um, you know, I didn't know what she had besides Ebola and grief. And but she she wouldn't even look at me. She looked at me with something akin to dislike when I put that tube down her nose, but she had a bed sore on her left hip. Anyway, so I said, well, you know, okay, you can come with me to this town, Maforki. Um, and he walked in the, you know, is it, if you've been into a pediatric, it's a pediatric ward, but every bed had, a, had an Ebola kid in it. Like a little baby who had been left for dead, who was fine and cute as a button. Geriatu was her name. Somebody had actually taken the time to take out her little golden earrings and plunk them in his garage. The only memento she will ever have if she had a family that loved her once. And then there was this heartbreaker of a boy named Ibrahim who was blind. And people are saying, what? Blindness is a complication of Ebola? Well, look, why don't you read the medical literature? Marburg, too, you know? So it was a pretty scary place, but the scariest of all was Mariatu. I mean, she just looked, she looks like a wraith, right? Ibrahim walks right by me, didn't ask which bed was hers, he could tell who it was, sat down on the bed. And started talking to her. And I, I'm, I'm, she must speak a language called Temni, but also Creo. And he, he, sp he spoke both those languages too, from the same part of the country, Sierra Leone. I don't even know what they were saying because suddenly another child named Isatu had a grand mal seizure. 
just fell on the floor right in front of me. And there was nobody else but me in there who was a health professional. And I had on gloves, that's it. And I was like, hey, somebody help me. But I mean, there's only one thing you do when a kid's seizing on the floor. You just pick her up. So, but I was really thinking like, I cannot wait to ask Peter what's going on. Because as she was seizing, Mariato took the sleeve of his shirt, hauled herself up to his ear, and whispered something in his ear. Supposedly brain damaged, unable to speak. Took me an hour to sort things out with the nurses for the other. That's Mariatu later, by the way. So clearly, Ibrahim did something good. But I said, so Ibrahim, what did she say? And he said, there's this special kind of juice I like in some cushions. Could you get me some? <laughs> See, I want to end on a happy story, right? Like, it, it, the, the reason that this is such a sad story is because we didn't put the staff stuff spaces and we didn't have the laboratory capacity. This isn't rocket science. Supportive care is nursing care. Critical care isn't rocket science either, right? But that never happens with crises. We don't invest in finding out new things we need to know, like is there a quicker test? Does the vaccine work? That actually happens. Can we, if you lose 211 of your nurses and doctors, as in Sierra Leone, what's the plan for reopening nursing schools, medical schools, and improving them? None. And what about this boring thing called health system strengthening? That, that didn't happen after the war, right? All the money went into a different idea of peacekeeping, which was necessary, right? The Nigerians couldn't stop the war with 20,000 troops, right? But to put all of the money into peacekeeping, warlike peacekeeping sometimes, and none of it into education, healthcare, and rebuilding social systems, that's the red carpet that got rolled out for Ebola. And that's why it happened there and not elsewhere. It doesn't have to be this way. Many of you have been to Haiti. This is my thank you to all those who donated to Partners in Health. You know, this is the nursing school in downtown Port-au-Prince. 453, third year nursing class, almost all dead, so were those two teachers. When we proposed, hey, you know, all of the all the medical schools, academic medical schools, dental school, they were all damaged and destroyed because the epicenter was near Port-au-Prince. Let's build a new academic medical center in rural Haiti outside of the earthquake zone. There's a road, it's only an hour or half away. And again, just like it wasn't the Africans who said, oh, come on, we can't possibly give that kind of treatment in Africa. But I never heard anybody say that. It was, you know, during the time that I was still working there. Uh, you'd say, oh, it might be difficult, but the idea is it's not cost effective, not feasible. If it's not a good idea after all the teaching hospitals in Haiti are destroyed, when is it ever going to be a good idea to have a teaching hospital in Haiti that's solar powered? that has 320 beds, that can train, for example, the first class of emergency medicine people, all women, by the way. Anyway, I saw so many, what are these called? Maquettes, mock-ups, charrettes, charrettes. Is that what they're called? I, I got so sick of seeing models, but this is this is actually came to pass. And many of you have been there, or some of you have been there. Uh, it looks a lot better than this now. I need a new picture. I'll only put the community health workers there to say there's just one part of the system. But the idea that we can't have the staff stuff space and systems that we need in a place like West Africa after all that it has done to build the modern world as we know it strikes me as historically untenable, political, politically ridiculous, and evinces a keen lack of understanding of political economy, current and past. And just now that didn't seem like a happy way to end, but I just want to say that I hope many of you, because some of you know Dr. Agnes Benagua, who is Vice Chancellor of this new university, is focused explicitly on global health equity. And I know the IHME and other institutions here in Seattle, which is a great hub of global health, have been involved. We invite, I mean, I'm not authorized to invite, and I'm afraid of it, Agnes. She's a, you know I'm right to be afraid of it. She's my best friend, but let's say that she's nice, you know, pediatrician, you know, they're really nice, they're little small ones, but don't mess with them. Right? 
one of the greatest people I've ever met. She's running this university. And I would ask, especially the deans and leadership, but also students, fac visiting faculty from Nigeria, keep an eye on this, help if you can. We will try to focus all of the medical training, all of the socio-medical training, all of the administrative training on equity. That doesn't mean we're gonna scant pathophysiology, medical history, electronic medical, all the other things that we should be learning and don't, how to have an insurance system, but we're gonna focus on equity. So thank you all, I know I went over, um, and I can't wait to come back. <laughs>